Hello. Uh, can everyone hear me all right? It's coming through okay? Yeah? Good. Perfect. Uh, so as Rob said, um, my name is Eric Assam, and I'll be speaking about uh, SIP35, uh, which is sort of better known as the opaque type SIP. Uh, just sort of one slide. Who am I? Uh, sort of a type level member, actually sort of co-founder, um, and work on SpireCats and a bunch of other li Scala libraries. Um, and actually very relevant for this SIP, uh, I sort of have like a very interested in static FP, very interested in sort of expressing your intention with types, but also really don't want to give up performance. Uh, some people kind of go for one or the other, but I feel like I really want to have my cake and eat it too in this. In this. And uh, my day job is doing machine learning at Stripe. I uh, support data scientists and help build sort of predictive models. So if you're interested in talking about Stripe or you know, machine learning, come talk to me later. This talk isn't really about that. And this is sort of where a lot of my code lives. Uh, so the one thing just to note is that this talk isn't about stuff that's in Scala right now. You can't actually do this stuff. So unfortunately, you, if this talk gets you really excited, you can't like download something and run it. Um, there's not even really a public branch of the, of the thing in progress. So uh, it's, it hasn't been approved, although I feel like it will be approved. Um, it's possible the proposal will change. So in a year, it's possible some of this talk will be out of date or wrong. Uh, so caveat emptor, especially those of you watching in the future, you know, if any. Uh, <laughs> so what we're going to cover, there's sort of four main sections to the talk. First, I just want to talk about typed classes and type aliases. And this is both because I think sometimes the distinction can get lost, and I want to make sure we're kind of all on the same page before we dive in to the actual SIP. Then we'll talk about just the SIP, you know, what it says, kind of go, go through it there. And then we'll talk about, like, the motivation and some actual examples of it, of it in use and kind of what it might do for us. And then finally, I'll, do, I'll kind of go through some pros and cons of it and compare it to especially value classes, but just kind of in general how we do things right now. So that's sort of the, the order. So, First, types, classes, type aliases. Um, so I guess raise your hand if you feel like you have a pretty good idea of what Scala types are. Like if someone was like, tell me what Scala types are. Okay, so like about half, two thirds of people. Great. So here's like six things you might think that types are. Um, raise your hand if you see your idea of what types are in this list somewhere. So like a few people. People are less confident now that there's like six possible things. Um, I'll just like rule the first two out. Like C kind of considers the first one to be what a type is. We're not in C. And like a lot of dynamic languages would probably consider the second. Like, you know, Python kind of has runtime in information that it checks. That's not what we're really talking about either. Um, so I'll sort of rule those out right away. So then we got four, sort of four candidates of what we might mean. So let's take a look at classes, right? I mean, string is a type. It's a class. So maybe types and classes are kind of the same thing because, you know, there's one string for both. Great. Um, I'm going to suggest that that's wrong, and this is sort of my counterexample here. So we have this type called pair that I wrote that maybe suspiciously resembles a tuple. Um, and when you compile it, there's like one class file. Um, and if you look in it, there's one class. So this is, you know, pair kind of represents a class. There's not multiple classes here, really. Um, but how many types does, does pair produce when we, when we write its definition? Um, the answer is it's sort of a trick question. Like it actually produces an infinite number of types. Uh, these are all distinct types. They're not equivalent. You know, you can't interchange them. And you can, and you can, I can keep constructing it. You notice I have pair, pair of Boolean. I could actually go forever just doing that and generate an infinite number of pair types. So it seems like classes and types have to be different because, um, because there's not a one-to-one -one correspondence here. Um, and, and to be maybe more explicit, pair is a parameterized type, which is also sometimes known as a type constructor. So that means a pair isn't even really a type itself. Pair produces types when you feed it types. So sometimes people write that as like star arrow star. That's sort of like notation from like Haskell or something. Uh, and so we would say that pair is it's not a, actually a proper type. It's a type parameter, and it produces proper types, you know, when given proper types as arguments, basically. So we've ruled Java classes off this list. We don't think it can be that. So how about sets of values? That sort of seems right. I mean, like, that's kind of, I certainly think about types as sets of values a lot of the time. Um, but I'm going to suggest that that's sort of wrong too, right? So I've got these two sort of traits, which, are, which maybe are types, Dupross and Mitten. And I've got these two objects, uh, Horlick and Claire, that extend them. And it's sealed, so there can't be any other values that extend these traits in the, in the universe anywhere. And so the point here is that I built a list that's typed to be list of Dupross with those two elements in it. And then I tried to assign that to, to a new uh, binding for a list of Minton, and that's not allowed. So list of Dupross and list of Minton, even though they have the same sets of values, they're not equivalent. Scala doesn't think that they're the same type, even though they have exactly the same set of values. So uh, if we had a structural type system, maybe that would work, and actually this would be the right definition, but we don't. So, um, and I'm just going to leave the last two up. I think the last two are, you know, there's probably some technical details that I'm leaving out, but I think these are the 
probably the two closest to what Scala's type system is actually is. It's maybe it's a system for constraining values in some way, and it's sort of syntactically stuff we write after the colon or stuff we put in the square brackets. You know, it's just they're sort of just syntax for. I mean, and I actually that's I think if you read like a type theory textbook, they'll say you know a type is a thing that corresponds to a term. So they don't really tell you type doesn't have essence that they really get at at this meeting. They sort of say they're just they just sort of exist and there's a relationship uh, between them. So. That's, that, maybe this did more harm than good, but hopefully this kind of got you thinking about the distinction between types and classes. Um, and so type aliases basically allow us to give a new name to a type. So here, we've got a Boolean type. I gave it the name true or false. Maybe I thought that was a better name than, than named after some dead guy. Um, and so I assigned true to true or false, but I, you can see that I can go back and forth between these types. They're equivalent. I can write one or the other. It's okay. So it's, it's the same as Boolean. Um, there, there's not a new type being introduced. So it's sort of confusing that when you use the type keyword, you might imagine you're introducing a type, but you're not. You're sort of just saying that this type is sort of equivalent to this, this right-hand side type. Um, type aliases also do another thing which is interesting, which is they can introduce type constructors, as I mentioned earlier. So in this case, we've actually got a type constructor that sort of throws away its argument and always returns int. Uh, was the first one. We've also got some other interesting type constructors that do various things. Um, this is not exactly the same. There's, there's sort of two different uses of them, um, but I just thought I, I'd bring it up. Um, so as far as type aliases go, a lot of us either work with or have worked with code kind of like this, where it's sort of stringly typed or there's a bunch of nut longs in there and they kind of mean things, like there's UID is along, GID is along, and this isn't always the best code, but you know, we, we often do work with it, and one thing I've seen people do, like I've done, I've seen people do, is you introduce type aliases for these longs, where you say, well, they're sure they're, they're both long, but I'm gonna give them names and I'll use the names in the right places to sort of help document what's going on, and I think, I think, so people sort of cast aspersions on this sometimes because it's not, because, because of there's problems, but actually I think it's a good starting point as an intuition of like, maybe you do want to use a better type than, than long or something like that. Uh, and so you can see that this old code still works. You know, we have this old find by, find by ID zero. You can still say find ID is zero even though we said that that's supposed to be a UID because UID is, is equivalent to long. Um, the reason why people don't like this so much is that there's sort of this weird behavior. So as you can see, I got the GID from my one user and now I'm doing a find by user ID with the GID, so I've kind of mixed up the UID and the GID here, and the type system doesn't care. Because they're both long, they're interchangeable, it's totally okay, but this might not, the user might have had made an error here, but the type system isn't helping them. So the reason why people don't necessarily love type aliases for this is this, this sort of problem that you still have to kind of get it right. It may be, it's like, it's like good documentation. You know, it helps point you in the right direction, but you still have to do the right thing yourself. Um, so as we sort of said, type aliases don't introduce new types, um, they're completely erased at compile time. They don't exist at runtime. That, that, they don't introduce anything that, that's around. Um, they can also build type constructors, and they can adapt to existing type constructors. Um, so hopefully th this, I'm, I'm trying to kind of lead you up to sort of why opaque types are different based on this stuff. So you can imagine that I'm gonna contrast them with you know, type aliases and maybe some other things. So here we go, SIP 35. Uh, SIP, just quick note, it's for Scala Improvement Process. That's what it stands for. Uh, there are formal proposals to change the Scala language. Um, they, they actually have in them changes to the Scala language specification that Martin wrote um, you know, a long time ago and has been kind of updated. Uh, they also have to include kind of motivation and examples and things. Um, the process has been around since 2000, 2012, but it hasn't always been super successful and it was rebooted in mid-2016 and has been a little bit less moribund uh, since then. So that's, that's sort of what's going on. Um, so the SIP is co-authored by um, Jorge, Vicente, Cantero, and myself, uh, and sort of the TLDR statement from, the, from it is a proposal to int introduce syntax for type aliases that only exist at compile time and emulate wrapper types. So the reason I was bringing up type aliases is I wanted you to have a good sense of what type aliases kind of are or how they work. Um, and if you want to read the actual document, the current version is here. Um, I'll be posting the slides at the end so you don't have to like frantically write this down or anything, but you know, it's there. Uh, so, We'll compare opaque types with type aliases. So as we said, type aliases are transparent. You and the compiler can see through them. You can switch them back and forth. You can inline them if you want. You don't have to use them. You can ignore them if you want. Uh, they don't introduce new types. They're completely erased, and they don't produce classes or anything. So opaque uh, type aliases are, are, are transparent, I'll say. Opaque types are not transparent. They're opaque. That, you know, it's in the name. <laughs> but um, uh, so the, critically, you can't see it through an opaque type in the same way. We can't just interchange the interchange long and UID, for example, if it was an opaque type. Um, authors can't line an inline opaque type. Even if they secretly know the implementation, they can't just swap it out, uh, third party authors anyway. You know, if you're the author of the opaque type, maybe you can do that. But uh, they do introduce new types, which exist at compile time. So they do introduce things that, different constraints. They think they introduce things that aren't equivalent, 
but they are still completely erased at, at runtime. Oh, that's a stupid bug. At runtime, they're gone. So that, that's a typo on my slide, sorry. Uh, they do not produce classes. They don't exist at runtime. They only exist at compile time. Um, so let's, let's go back to kind of our example here. So we have opaque type, UID, long. That's all you have to do. You've defined an opaque type. So you just add the opaque keyword in front of type, and now it's opaque. That's all you do. Um, but not really, that's, all, that's not really all you do because you can't do much with this thing. So you can't actually produce UIDs if you only write this. There's no way to get into the type. So as you can see, I wrote some code here that you might imagine creates UIDs and none of it works, except for the casting, which is verboten. You're not supposed to do that. So um, don't, don't, you know, don't do that. Uh, um, but so what you do if you want to be able to talk about the fact that UID is secretly along is in the UID companion, that fact is known. So in the companion of UID, you can actually go between long and UID freely and it's okay. So if you see here, I defined a val u1 that's just zero um, as a UID, I can do that inside the companion, but outside I can't do the same thing. So the same code that works in the companion will not work anywhere else in the universe. The companion is the only legit place to, you know, the opaque type is willing to kind of be less opaque in its companion, but nowhere else, basically. Um, so I guess I just summarized this slide before getting here, great. Um, but so anything you want to do with these things has to be in there. You can't, you can't directly access the value anywhere else. So any kind of constructors, accessors, validation, whatever you do has to some way link with that companion. That's the one place you can do it. Otherwise, no access is permitted of any kind. Um, so, and then when I say about erased, I, maybe you don't have a good intuition what it means, so let's kind of go through an example of what I mean. So in this case, we have a list of any. It could be, it has anything in it. We lost a bunch of type information. You probably shouldn't write this code, but I think it's good for illustrating what's going on. So we can still call to string on these things and tell them apart, right? So you see we've got a one, and then the word two, and then 3.0. So we kind of know there's like an int, and then maybe a string, and then a double. You can recover that type information from the two string representation, sort of. So, so that's, we, we erased the type of, of, of the list, but then we kind of recovered it at runtime in a, this sort of sneaky way. But opaque types, you can't do that. There's no difference between the opaque type and the long at runtime. That's what I mean by erased. They're exactly the same. It's as if you had written long the whole time. So as you can see, we have two lists. One uses that UID we defined. One uses the literal zero, and it's, it's identical. There's no runtime observable di behavior difference um, with, with, once you have the values in hand. Um, the UID might define methods on the companion that produce different stuff, but the, but the values itself, you know, the, the sort of value you're holding onto at runtime is identical. So, so that's sort of what I mean there. Um, and that also kind of implies that opaque types, they don't have methods. There's nothing to override. So opaque types can't override toString. They can't override hash code. They can't override equals. They can't override anything. They have no, like, class identity or methods or anything like that. So you can't, you can't interact with the runtime in that way. They, they sort of use whatever their underlying value would have used. So if you're wrapping along, it'll use what long, what Java line long would. If you're wrapping string, it would use Java line string. Whatever you're wrapping, it'll just use those methods. Um, if you, if you get to a case where you're, you're kind of doing this sort of uh, runtime access. So, so any questions so far before I get into motivation and examples? One question. Yeah. Does opaque type wrap more than one other type? Um, yes, but only via like a tuple or something. It can't, it can't mention multiple values at the same time. So I think if, if um, you know, if Java supported structs, then maybe it would be a different story. But yeah, right now the tuple or like a collection is the only way that an opaque type can wrap multiple values. Another question? Uh, does, does the opaque type conform to the supertypes of the original type? No. It has no subtyping relationship with anything. So there are any, and that's it. There's no, um, they're not serializable, they're not anything. Um, so yeah, you, uh, yeah you, if, you, if you need those things, you need to either convert from the opaque type to another type that has it, or the underlying type needs, like if you're hoping, say, say you're using Java serialization, if you're wrapping types that are serializable, then at runtime, those values will still be serializable via the sort of runtime process, but the opaque type doesn't advertise that fact, and it can't be accessed in the type system. So um, it, sort of, it sort of prevents you from doing that. One more question. Um, so what happens if you have a, an abstract type that's not opaque, and then you override that with an opaque type? Is that, is that allowed? I th that's allowed as long as the abstract type has no um, constraints on it. So if your abstract type is required to be a subtype of something or required to do something, then you can't. But if it's just a if it's just ha type hanging out, then it's totally legit to use an opaque type to implement that. Yeah. yeah. 
They're like, oh, I can violate your invariant. Yep. Yeah, no. You, and, and another thing that I actually didn't put in the slide, you can't pattern match on these things either, so you can't take them apart. Um, you can cast, as I said, you shouldn't cast, but you know, you can, we can't prevent you, but you don't, they don't provide any kind of like easy access into what the guts of the thing are. That's sort of the point. So, um, so anyway, as I said, motivation, introduce types without classes, and that's kind of why I tried to draw the distinction earlier is that opaque types are interesting because they're types that don't necessarily, they, they might have classes underneath, but you, they might not, and you don't know that. The, the type itself doesn't have any obvious class linkage at compile time. Um, and one thing that's cool about this is it kind of gives authors more control over the erasure phase. Like currently when you use classes, scholars erasure rules are pretty set, but opaque types are interesting in that we can decide what you want your runtime representation to be and what you want your compile time interface to be, and those can be very distinct. Normally you can use Java access controls, but that's about it. Um, this gives you like a lot more power in kind of an interesting way. Um, you also get a predictable runtime representation and performance in the sense that we guarantee that it will always be the representation you use. If you say that this type is secretly an array of byte, it will always be an array of byte. Uh, you, they can't necessarily get at it as an array of bytes, but it will, at runtime it will be that. Whatever you need it to be, it will be. So it's, it gives you this interesting control. And you can limit access to existing classes. So for example, if you have a Java API and you want to be using those Java objects, but you, maybe you don't want the full power to be available, if you wrap those Java objects in an opaque type, you can expose a subset of the API um, prevent access without imposing any overhead. There's, as opposed to in traditional wrapping where you have to wrap the things and then you're creating extra objects and then you, you go and do this stuff. In this case, at runtime it'll be the exact same objects you would have had, but, but you can just be sure that someone didn't call certain methods you don't want them to call. So these are some possible motivations. And then let's go into some code that does this. So here's some code that an author might write. Um, this is sort of like for interfacing with Java APIs if you you know, option is great for that, and I'm not suggesting that option is bad or you shouldn't use it, but if you find yourself in like a, like a very tight loop or a very hot context, you find yourself not wanting to create, you know, millions of options for these low-level Java API calls, but you do need to do null checks, this opaque type would be interesting to you. So it's called safe. It wraps any type that's itself in any ref, so null, so it can have a null value. And safe is basically sort of a little bit like an option where it treats the null as the missing value and treats everything else as present, um, but then you can, you can do things like recover or you can implement sort of this flat map looking thing below. You can implement whatever methods you want that you, an option would have, but you can be sure that there's no boxing. It's not actually introducing new values at runtime. It's just giving you the kind of null checks. Uh, so if you wrap your values in safe, you can kind of be sure that you'll never accidentally get null pointers because you can't, you can't get an A value back out except via recover, which has a default. So basically the idea is when you, when you lift your da data into this safe opaque type, it's no longer directly, the nulls are no longer directly accessible anymore. You can only recover the A type you want to work with via some kind of safe thing, whether that's um, you know, flat mapping and then recover or just recover or possibly some other combinators we didn't write. You'd have to do something like that. Um, and so this is the code written by the author and then if we jump over here, this is what the compiler is actually going to be emitting. So at runtime, this is what your code is going to be. Uh, the, the safe type is gone. There's no type anymore. There's still a companion. The companion sticks around at runtime and there's these sort of like potentially static methods here that don't actually mention a safe type. And as you can see, it's just doing the kind of basic null checks we all do, maybe or used to do a long time ago, you know, when we wrote Java. It's just doing those same checks you would expect. Um, so the code's very easy to inline, very simple. Um, and so if you wrote this code up here where you wrap some unsafe Java API and then you call recover to, you know, get a, get a string out, at, run, at post, post inlining and post compilation, you're gonna get something that looks very like the code you might have written if you were checking for null directly. So that's the attractive thing about this, is that you can, be very, you can produce code that's very close to the kind of low level code you might have wanted, but you don't actually have to write it, and you can be sh enforce some invariance around how it's actually getting generated, which is cool. So, and um, I am being a little optimistic about inlining, and we can get into that, but this is, this is basically what's, what's gonna happen. Um, so, so it's worth noting there are differences between safe and option, and safe isn't always the one you would want to use. So safe string is equivalent to string at runtime. Like I said, it doesn't exist. Safe, the safe constructor does not allocate any instances unlike option. Uh, any ref constraints means safe has no monad. You can't actually nest safes. There's only one null value, so you can't distinguish, you can't represent a safe of safe of string. How would you know which level was null? Because there's only one null value. So safe, so safe this, this type constraint on the parameter means that it can't really be a monad. It can't be generally it can't be as powerful generally as option is. So option is better in cases where you want to be truly parametric. Um, safe all doesn't have any methods defined. If you go back, we, we have these, these functions here in the companion, but there's no, if you have a safe value in hand, you can't call safe dot anything. There's, there's nothing there. It's a, it's a type that has no methods. Uh, so that's an interesting difference. Um, and modulo inlining, safe doesn't add any overhead. Um, so there's no, definitely no objects, instances being created, and 
other than sort of these, these sort of static-esque methods, there's no, there's no extra stuff. Um, so if you, if you need to call methods, you can, you can use enrichment, something we use in Scala already. You can enrich opaque types. So that's the sort of, if you want that method syntax, the thing you would do is provide this enrichment in the companion so that, that it can see that these opaque types, it can tell what the underlying representation is and work with it. So in this case, we can implement recover as a method on, on, the, safe, on the safe opaque type in this way. Uh, and you could kind of mix and match. You could do all the, the function style. You could do all the enrichment style. You could actually do both. Um, you know, the author has total control over how they choose to do that. Um, and again, using this um, enrichment syntax, you'd kind of write it like this. You'd get values out, you'd call your function, and at runtime, or at post compilation, this is sort of what you'd end up with. You'd end up with the kind of direct calls to the, use the unsafe Java API, and then the null checks kind of getting, getting more or less inlined. Um, you know, with no, no, nothing else going on. Question? Um, yeah. It's also the case, I think, that, that uh, if you have a, a, a binding of type of safe something, you can't assign null to it because it doesn't conform with the null type. Correct. That's right. Yeah. So you can't assign null to it directly. You've, right. And actually, I, I left it out for space reasons, but if you wanted to be able to talk about the empty safe value, you have to define it in the companion. You could have a val empty or like a def empty in the companion that produces null values for you. But yeah, once if you fail to do that, no one else can do that either. There's no way to introduce, to start with null which is kind of cool, right? It's kind of interesting that you, you can use other people's nulls, but you, you can't use your own, right? It's like, kind of reminds me of like, you know, growing up in my, my parents' rules or whatever, but um, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, uh, um, so, so are the previous inlinings realistic? And so Jorge and I have like done a little bit of benchmarking, a little bit of work on this, and we think so like more or less. So um, most of the methods that you do are super small and very easy to inline, right? So it's like literally, a lot of them are literally identity calls, you know, like A, ret you know, return the thing you were given, and those, sh you know, the GVM is super good at inlining those. Um, and all the methods are like static and they're not, they're never part of an interface or anything. So you're generally gonna have a pretty good chance of inlining them well. Uh, value classes, I know I sort of talk trash about them, but enrichment is the case where they do best. They, they, they're very reliable about not boxing for enrichment, which is the one thing we're using them for. So we think that's a reasonable thing to do. The SIP does say that if we find out that enrichment with value classes has terrible performance, we'll kind of revisit that. But um, so far, we haven't been able to find cases where that was really a, a problem, where that really significantly slowed things down. Um, and the, type, the constraints on opaque types, basically, I mean that we could, if we need to, in compiler phases, we can do the optimization. We can do the inlining ourselves. So if, if we found cases where it really wasn't working, you know, a third party could do a compiler plugin to do this. We could amend the SIP to do it. A later SIP could do it. There's, the nice thing is because we're making no, there's so little impact on on the language, it means that we have a lot of freedom to do these kind of inlinings. You know, the, the opaque types don't have any semantics that they guarantee. So what, you're free to inline those, those methods as much as you want. There's no like runtime class you might be screwing up, which is great. So here's another example, um, type tagging. So how many people have seen type tagging before? Like in, okay, so like a, maybe half of people, great. So I'm introducing this weird infix type constructor called at at. Um, it turns out in Scala that with these sort of symbolic types, you can actually put the type between the, the things, which is sort of novel when you first see it. And in this case, I think it's kind of nice. But um, so basically the idea of tagged here is that we have the value S is what we're actually, it's actually the value we're gonna have at runtime. We wanna tag it with some type information to distinguish different S's. So we, might, we wanna have different, different values of type S that we can keep track of that they're not the same, that we aren't gonna mix them up. So, um, as you can see, tag has all these methods for tagging and untagging. And one thing you'll notice is that literally all the methods are identity. It's just take an S, return an S. Take an ST, return an ST. Take an FS, return an FS. Take an FST. But you'll see that the types are changing, and that's what's important here. So the thing that distinguishes this from a lot of other strategies is that, um, in general, other, other tagging libraries either have to use casts for this, or they end up having to like map over the thing because you have a list of one. Like if you use case classes as tags, if you want to convert between the tagged and untagged representation, you actually have to map over like a list or something to tag or untag correctly. In this case, we can use the fact that we know that they're the same at runtime in the companion to provide these methods that go back and forth without having to cast or map or do anything at all. Um, and then you can see that I used the deep tag to basically re-tag an ordering of S as an ordering of ST. So in other words, if we have some kind of tag type uh, S, you know, S tagged with T. If we know how to sort S's, we do know how to sort S's tagged with T's as well. And we get that for free via this deep tag call um, that you see down there. Uh, so if we use this thing, I mean, I don't know that units are, ne are necessarily the best case, but I just thought it'd be like kind of evocative, so I, I did it here. So you can see we have two double values both tagged with meters. 
so we can sort those because they're, they're the same units. Um, this is, and, and if we had a fancy units library, maybe you'd convert between the units, but whatever. That's why the example is kind of bad. But as you can see, we have, we have another double that's tagged differently. It's tagged with feet. It's not tagged with meters. So you can sort a list of just, of just doubles tagged with feet, but if you try and mix them, the, the type of that is actually list any. There's no common supertype between the double of meters and the double of feet. So it's not going to do something weird where it like converts up to double and then does it for you. Now you've mixed up your values. It says actually that was a list of any you gave me and I can't sort that. I have no ordering for, or, for, uh, for any. So you get the kind of behavior you would want if you really want these types to be firmly distinguished. Um, if, you want, if you want tag types to actually have a common supertype, then this approach would not be good for you. In general, I think this is usually what I want, but there are, you know, there's, it's an open debate how you, how you might want it. Um, but I thought this was sort of a nice evocative example. Uh, and just to show you what this kind of looks like after the com compilation, after inlining, you know, the tag type goes away, so we have these specialized, you know, static methods that just basically run identity that should be inlined. And then we have this, again, this kind of identity implicit that takes an ordering of S and returns an ordering of S. Um, the implicit keyword is sort of, uh, deceptive because actually it's not going to be, it, there's, implicit has no meaning at runtime, so I could have just removed that. But point is, it's just passing these things through. There's no, it's not imposing any extra boxing cost or any extra, real extra overhead there. Uh, and then if you look at the code, the sort of usage, it's basically going to look like if you had just ignored tags. You know, we've got two double values, uh, we sort them, we've got another double value, we can sort it twice, and then this sorted call fails due to stuff at compile time, even though if you had written this code in terms of double, that would have compiled. But the key, the key is, is that it, you know, we, can, we can cause that to fail without impacting the other cases that were valid. That's the sort of exciting thing. Um, so as I said, they're opaque at compile time. You can, you can look at their runtime form. Um, you can figure out what they're going to do pretty easily. You basically, you take the left-hand side of opaque type and replace it with the right-hand side. You inline all the inline methods. And that's pretty much it. And if you want to be generous, you can also inline all the sort of simple methods that you think the JVM would inline. If you do those things, that's pretty much how the transformation works. There's no, unlike some other transformations in Scala, it's very easy to reason about, I think. There's not really much else to it. So compared to some other things about erasure, I think this is pretty nice. It's got this property that's more, it's easier to understand what's going on. Um, and you can run the logic in reverse, which is cool too. You can start with some code that's like really optimized, but maybe like horrible and doesn't have good types and then figure out where you want to limit access, where, you, where you're worried things are unsafe. You can introduce the opaque types, and you know that you're not going to be imposing tons of extra overhead. If your code is fast enough in this form, it's probably fast enough for adding this extra type safety because you're, all you're doing is adding these static methods that can be inlined. You're not adding in, you know, interface calls or, or you know, megamorphic methods or anything that's going to likely defeat uh, the jitting that you were previously seeing when you didn't do it. Um, of course, we have to, this has to bear out in practice. Like, I can't claim that it's not going to do it, but like, in our tests, it hasn't done it, and we, we are like, very optimistic that we think, we think it, will, it will do well. Um, so you can, you can introduce opaque types to improve type guarantees and add just the methods that you need to the companion or you know, enrichment or whatever and limit access while still having the performance that you sort of wanted. Um, so one kind of caveat here. We say that opaque types minimize boxing, and this is true, but I think the kind of correct formulation, this is something Sebastian pointed out at the last SIP meeting, is that opaque types don't introduce any boxing that wasn't already present in your code. So if your code was already going to do boxing, like, like double, if you put doubles into a list, they box. That's just how double works. Opaque types don't magically fix that. So if you, if you put an opaque type in a list and the opaque type is secretly a double, it'll still box just like the double would have. But the point is that they don't box in cases where the double wouldn't have. So you don't have this, this impedance mismatch. Um, it's, they're not a panacea for all boxing. If you don't want your collection to box, you still might have to specialize it or do something kind of fancy. Uh, so here's another example. Um, so first of all, maybe before I do another example, any questions so far? Are people kind of following it? One question. <laughs> so the hope is that we'll get it in 2.13. The door, I, my understanding is the ship has not sailed on 2.13, but like, you know, it's, the harbor master has blown the horn and they're starting to raise the gangplank, so like we need to like really you know, rush it, but it's possible this could be in 2.13. Um, the SIP hasn't technically been approved, but like I've, I've been sort of told by people that they like it and think it will be approved, and it's, we're sort of working through edits on the SIP and Jorge is kind of iterating on the actual code for the compiler, so we're ho I'm hoping 2.13, possibly 2.14 if we, if we fail to kind of get our, get our stuff together. Other question? How does this work with like overloading functions or uh, specialization? <laughs> so do you mean how do opaque types interact with specialization? And how do they, how, like if you overload into functions or something like that and you have a you know, both for int and for your you know, special? You can't distinguish them, so you can't, they, yeah, you can't, 
you can't use overloading to distinguish between an opaque type and a non-opaque type. Um, I don't, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's true. I have to remember, reread the SIP and talk to Jorge possibly, but I'm pretty sure that that's not going to work reliably. I mean, you might be able to, Scala might let you define them. It's, you know, it might let you define it, but it's not going to work properly in a lot of cases because the opaque type has no, there's no runtime dispatch, the dynamic dispatch it can do to correctly thread those cases. So yeah, it's not, it's not going to work, and I think we're forbidding it at compile time. Um, but one thing that's cool is that actually this does work with specialization. So in other words, if, if, if your code with ints was going to correctly specialize, your opaque type wrapping in it will also specialize. Because it's erased at compile time, it uses the exact same code path through the compiler that int would have. So you can, we, you can be sure that your you know, specialized tuples, specialized functions, specialized whatever, all that stuff still works. Um, specialization is kind of like rickety, so of course you have to really be sure that your specialization actually works. But, um, you know, but modulo that, it, it does work. Have to know the type at compile time to, to get the right. But but the compiler does know the right type. If the compiler doesn't give you the view of the right type. With the opaque type. Yeah, it does. The compiler so the compiler can see that the opaque types are, are equivalent. It just doesn't let you see that. So by the time we get to the specialization phase, it's erased those and they're just doubles again. Um, really, the distinction is really only important for typer and some phases after that, where it's determining if your program type checks. Once all that happens, it throws the opaque types away, and they go right back to their kind of underlying erased form. So it, it does work. Um, one more question. On the same line, uh, to string after this kind of JVM object method, what's going to happen here? It's sort of equivalent to using any. I don't think we can, because, because any is defined as having these, like, you know, if you, if you write values as any, you can still call to string on it. We, we don't really have a way to turn that off. As far as I know, I mean, it'd be cool if we did, but I don't think we do. So basically what's going to happen is if you do use those things, it's, it, it's, it's always going to use the underlying type. So if you need different behavior from an opaque type, that's not a good match because opaque types can't interact with that. They can't change the, 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 the they can't override methods or anything. So that's a situation where using a case class or a value class might be a better, a better option. Um, let's see how we're doing on time. Uh, like no more time. All right, um, let me just jump to the end then. Uh, so really quickly, three more minutes. I just want to sort of contrast with value classes, just to kind of help explain the difference. So value classes introduced in 2.10, very specific class requirements on their structure. They can only extend universal traits. They can't extend other stuff. They avoid allocating objects in some cases. Their, their main use is for zero cost enrichment, which they do very well. But the class can still exist at runtime. It's not totally erased. Um, they have capabilities that opaque types lack. You're able to define methods. You can do this kind of overriding that Dennis was talking about. You can distinguish them from their underlying type at runtime in many, in most cases. Uh, they can participate in subtyping relationships via this universal trait, and you can, over, you, you can override these, these different methods you might need to. Um, but then there's sort of these downsides, which is that value classes unpredictably box, and most people, myself included, have a very hard time being 100% certain you know the semantics. I mean, like, I know it pretty well, but even so, you kind of have to decompile your code to really be sure. Um, and by default, the access is available for everything. So if you want to lock them down and have them be as opaque as possible, you have to put a whole bunch of access, remember to put a whole bunch of access modifiers in the constructor and the extractor to ensure that people can't get at the underlying value. Um, they don't ever take advantage of specialization. They're never specialized. They always allocate when used in an array. They always allocate in generic context. That's just stuff that's true about them. So by contrast, opaque types are always erased and are often able to perform better in, in some of those cases I mentioned. So. Um, Basically, I'll skip the example because we're out of time, but basically, value classes are best used, in my opinion, to provide low-cost enrichment in cases where you kind of want a traditional wrapper, maybe want to optimize it, and then in direct context, like you have a field and you're only ever accessing it specifically. In those cases, I think value classes are really positive and you might really want to use them instead. In other value classes, I think they're more marginal and maybe should be avoided because they're, they're not going to deliver what you want. Um, so I guess we're pretty much done. SIP 35 is moving quickly. We got good feedback. We're revising the text. We're targeting 213, who knows you know, if we'll get in. Um, uh, and so I'm interested in your feedback. Are this, is this exciting to you? Are you skeptical? Are you confused? You know, please let us know. I mean, it's, it can be changed. You know, it's not set in stone yet. So I would love to hear from you whether you think this is useful or, or less useful or you know, what, what your thoughts are. Um, so thank you. <laughs>